hey everyone um good to have you here with us online i appreciate taking the time um i know it's already due time but let's give two more minutes for those folks that are running late to, to join us and while we're waiting for them i'd like to present a special guest tonight the joint belkins uh, webinar um uh, webinar today um, his name is Ross Pranstone, a great partner and a friend of mine from HubSpot. Uh, Ross, uh, great and good to, to have you here with me today for this discussion. Thanks so much, Michael. Yeah, super excited to be here with you all. Um, talk about, you know, what, what goes into, you know, the things that, that you all do for your clients and how, you know, HubSpot plays a small role in that. Um, and yeah, super excited to, you know, hear from from the you know chat or or uh, audience members what questions they have or how this applies to their business happy to dive into all those things you know i actually um i didn't talk a lot about hops with in general because uh, over the last few years we've been you know focusing on appointment setting generally sending out cold emails folderly everything related to the services um however not many people realize how um, how much time we spend on integrating houseport infrastructure in our internal process and what incredible yep. results we achieved um, within the last three years of, of kind of using your platform. And uh, today is the time, today is the hour where I can kind of go ahead and just share what was done and what is the best practices that we've achieved over the years working with, with, with your platform. So that's so cool to have you here with me online because first you obviously can share some insights from you know, from the from the uh, from the HubSpot scene, right? Like, how do you yeah. guys perceive these things? And I can kind of tell the the gang here about what I'm doing and how we are doing this on 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 Balkan end. Okay, so uh, essentially, guys, we're going to be talking about four main topics today. We're going to talk about basics for inbound appointment setting, why, when, and how, and what are the companies to use this. Uh, we're going to talk about leads collection. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about HubSpot scoring and attribution and about inbound leads nurturing. I think that these are the four key points where anyone that is interested in about, uh, inbound appointment setting can, can utilize and generally sort of like focus on right now. Okay. So to kick off, uh, for, you know, for you, you guys know, Belkins is an agency. We are international. We have hundreds of clients. We, uh, we primarily uh, attract these clients through multiple channels. And uh, those that have been to our website, you saw we do a lot of content. We do a lot of SEO, link building, external websites. We do a lot of emailing. So we do all of that, right? And, and we use HubSpot as our central tool or platform to aggregate data from all of those channels into one place. And then we have a process that allow us to nurture, tag, structure, categorize, sort of like evolve all of these leads into uh, sales qualified leads, opportunities, and so on and so forth. And, um, and what I think is that this process that we have is applicable and can be replicated by any B2B company that either a service or a product, pro, pro, product like globally. And as long as you guys have a sales team, as long as you are working on attracting and acquiring leads and you sell those leads through having a demo call or a presentation, or essentially when you have a, a sort of like a sales pipeline and a sales process, right? Um, Ross, question to you here. Uh, what, are the, what are the most popular uh, industries or the where where you see the the more people are investing in inbound from the you know from the b2b stand from from the tech standpoint yeah well i mean i think to start one thing that's great about hubspot is it it's very industry agnostic so it isn't built initially for any one use case i think you know it always will depend on some of the particulars but that being said, some of the really, you know, common ones, you know, customers we see all the time, you know, SaaS or, you know, IT type companies, um, manufacturing is huge. Um, if any company that's, that's doing recruiting, um, or if it's a full time, like recruiting staffing agency, it's really big. Um, and then, you know, it, it just goes from there. I think, um, uh, other, other principles besides just industry would be, um, a longer sales process that has lots of different checkpoints along the way, um, a higher 
you know, average sales price, um, something that's a more considered purchase, not just something that you can get, you know, go to your website and buy something on the same day. Um, so I think all those situations make, make it a, a good fit for lead scoring for, um, you know, marketing automation and, you know, obviously get it into the salespeople's hands with the CRM. Yeah. Um, when people think about HubSpot in general and about this inbound appointment sending process, they think that this is very complicated. They think that this is something that we can utilize later down the road, right? Because we don't have many people in our sales team right now. We don't have many leads right now. So we think that maybe we can do this, but later down the road. And I'll, I always say that this is the biggest mistake they would make. And the reason is that when you start a company or when you start and just start building out your sales team and you have the first first lead, your first 10 leads, you need to start with a scalable partner, with a scalable solution. Then as you go, you can evolve and grow with, right? Because the the problem that I've seen very uh, very often is that when you start and you just have 10 leads and you think, hey, well, I can use something simple, something cheap or something like a spreadsheet, right? Yeah. You would, it's, it's not just not scalable, but that later you're going to spend 10 times more time on making sure that you are migrating all of this to a new platform, educating your team on that platform, creating and process learning about all of the things there, right? And only, uh, and that would basically means that you lose a lot of time, a lot of revenue and a lot of efficiency in your process. So uh, what I do all the time, and uh, I think that Ross can confirm this because I always reach out to him. Whenever we start a new product or a new company, the first thing I do um, when I bring up my, my marketing person, my, my sales uh, rep, I always go ahead and I set up a new Houseport account for that product. And I start every first lead, first deal is already on HubSpot, right? Uh, what I what I really like about your your uh, your platform, Ross. And by the way, uh, you know this webinar is not about selling HubSpot. It's just generally very passionate about the software. Um, yeah. What I like is that I can start with a free package, right? With with the free one, and then I, as I go, I grow and 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 if I need more and more features, I add them. But the most important is that every contact, every company, every deal is already recorded on HubSpot and I'm tracking that from the get-go, right? Um, what I'll do, I'll quickly transition to this uh, to this slide here. And uh, by the way, guys, uh, if you have any questions whatsoever, go ahead and put those questions in the chat or in the, in a QA box there because uh, we're gonna spend we're gonna spend probably 15, 20 minutes at the end of this answering your questions. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and 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 and, and type down those questions. Okay. Uh, today we're not gonna be talking a lot of like watering this down, really hard facts, how this is set up for Belkins and how we utilize this, right? So from you, what you see on the screen right now is that's how we see the, the inbound process, right? So there are different sources or landing pages for leads. So people can register it, uh, on the website. Uh, there might be a referral lead or a direct inquiry to uh, people who are really sending emails to sales balkans or marketing balkans that I or something like that, right? Every lead has a different touch point. For example, um, on our website, we have a book a call button, right? So people just go ahead and book a call. Uh, they can. Yeah, we have a, one input form on the website where people can just, hey, contact us and just put the, your email, that's it. We have different pop-ups like, hey, get 20 leads. Hey, do this. Uh, we have a chat. We have a, a, a blog newsletter, a blog sign up. Uh, you see we do in webinars here, right? And what is interesting and why I see this is very important to highlight during this webinar is that Depending on an entry point, we have a different leads life cycle stage. So the life cycle stage is sort of like the stage um, where you can determine the, the buying intent of a lead or sort of, sort of like the nurture phase of the lead. So, for example, on HubSpot, um, always the subscriber is the first entry point. So the, the subscribers have the lowest buying intent. And then obviously opportunity has the, the highest buying intent, right? So depending on, a, on where the customer engages with you or what is the page that they registered, you can automatically, and I'm going to talk about that in a, in a minute, you can automatically set up a certain life cycle. And then depending on that life cycle, you could treat the prospect differently. So in a way, your process for, for working with subscribers or working with marketing qualified leads or with the opportunity can be so different. And that based on that, you can even assign a different owner. 
So for example, if you go ahead and you book a call on the website and you, you finish up the booking page where you answer the questions about your budget, about your problems, what you're looking for. So you kind of go through a certain qualification process in a way. So when this call is booked, it goes straight to our sales exec, right? So in a way, you already are an opportunity because you are a pre-qualified, interested uh, person or a business that has a need, that has the budget, that works, that wants to talk to us. So you are in the opportunity stage. So in a way, when we talk and we confirm this opportunity, then the sales exec can really directly work with you and sort of like understand and create a scope of work and so on and so forth. And this is very interesting because transitioning from just entering the Belkin's website and being an opportunity and working with our sales exec takes only one, one step, one minute. So I don't need a team or I don't need a lot of things happening at the same time. It's just a very streamlined, very efficient process. Whereas if you're entering and requesting information about our pricing or you wanted to have a pop-up, so we, I'm, we don't know what your intent is, right? then you can go to our inbound SDR so that you go through the inbound qualification process where you get on a quick call with an SDR or SDR sends you a couple of emails and ask some questions, right? Which is also different from, for example, you guys going to a chat and asking something in the chat where you can be a lead and then can be processed by our uh, uh, you know, SDR. So the point that I'm making here, and this is so great, is that you're treating your website as sort of like, like a, your strategic look at your website from the standpoint of, of what are the entry points of my leads? And then depending on the entry points, using HubSpot as your platform and integrating all of these uh, you know, small pieces of, of, of entering points, right? You can understand and you can create a process for each individual life cycle and make the process super, super efficient and then treat that as the standalone thing, right? And Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it's really instructive to think about you know, what happens if we don't get this right? You know, we probably won't provide someone with as good of an experience as we would, you know, if we have it clearly mapped out and if we execute on that. A good example would be a marketing lead that maybe just went on the blog or said yes to a newsletter, getting a call from an SDR. It's like, they're not ready to talk to anybody yet. That's actually making them a little turned off that they're getting a call so quickly. On the other hand, you might have somebody that's actually ready to talk, that's highly interested, and then those leads, for some reason, don't get to the sales team fast enough. That's time is money. We all know that if somebody waits too long, they're going to go to a competitor, you know? So I think you got to nail this, and it's a little different for each business, but it's also the principles are exactly the same um, overall, you know? Yeah. And exactly to your point is that depending on the life cycle and buying intent, there might be different number of touch points that you need to make to convert that prospect, right? Whereas, for example, with a subscriber, you really need maybe 10 touch points where you start slow with some marketing emails and then some, some advertising, you know, maybe some invitations to webinar. And with the opportunity, for example, you maybe need all the three to five touches, right? So what is interesting is that uh, you can create, a, 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 we call it like a nurturing sequence or a process for each individual life stage, depending on their landing page. And you can determine how many sales touch points you need to do to convert that prospect to an opportunity. So then you can make a sale and you can measure each one of those uh, stages of the process individually. And that is, that is why, for example, what I love about HubSpot is that each and every entry page can be uh, considered as a different sort of like instance, right? So in a way, um, you can create multiple forms, you can create multiple landing pages, you can create multiple instances of entry lead, and then using the workflows that we're going to talk in a minute, you can create those sequences and those nurturing sequences individually for each and every one. And then during the reporting, understand which one works and how they work and how they convert, which is like amazing, I think. Uh, so moving on, um, I wanted to uh, to talk with, with you guys about how you can set up this HubSpot lead collection process that I really love. And so it's typically it takes like 
I think a few minutes, but it takes like four steps. So on HubSpot, under marketing, you have HubSpot form. Essentially, this is the instance that you can use to collect leads from the website. The forms can have different input fields. They can be so different. So the pop-up can be a form. The contact task can be a form. There will be a, in one input email can be for a call can be for whatever but what is interesting is that you have uh, like a, a builder that you can build different forms and so what we did so every form on our website was pre-built on hubspot as the hubspot form and then our developers will quickly connect it because we have a custom-made website they connected the hubspot form through api with our website with our cms and in this manner, whenever someone fills out the form on the website, they directly fills out the form on HubSpot in a way. So that gives me this unique ability to understand which form are filled, when they're filled, and then I can create multiple unique forms on HubSpot, which is like amazing because then what I do is that I create a workflow on HubSpot about treating each and every form individually and then nurturing that specific form based on the form submitted, which is the, the easiest way of uh, kind of categorizing and bucketing down different type of prospects here. And then you can adjust and track and, and so on and so forth. So here's how it looks typically. So let me kind of highlight for you. So when we, I have a new product, Leads Force, right? And they have a trial. So what I did, I, I created the form on HubSpot. I called uh, uh, Leads Force app registration form. And I triggered an API whenever this form is submitted, right? Well, whenever this form is submitted and I know this, what I can do is I can say, hey, HubSpot, whenever there's a new form submission, please make sure that you set up a contact property of the life cycle as the marketing qualified lead because I'm treating that lead as the marketing qualified lead. And please set up a status as new, right? Because it was triggered just now. So this is a new lead, a new marketing lead that just submitted the form for me. That, that, that easily, right? Then I say, hey, set up a contact owner and my BDR, my height, right? So he's my BDR. So it means that every time there is a new contact, I can set up a new owner. And what is interesting here is that depending on the form, you can have multiple owners, you can have multiple lead statuses, you can have multiple life cycles. So I can say, if you fill out the form A, then maybe my, the contact order will be my sales exec. If you set up a form B, then my contact order will be my BDR, which is like amazing because in this manner, we automatically can assign and kind of streamline leads in different directions and measure them differently, right? Um, after that, I would say, okay, you wanted to add something here, Ross? I'm just going to say, yeah. I mean, what you're seeing here is, is the workflows tool in HubSpot, extremely powerful. And a really good rule of thumb that I, you know, borrow from a uh, VP of marketing at HubSpot named John Dick is, um, you know, automation without personalization is really just spam, right? So the reason why you can have a workflow for each form or each different lifecycle stage is to make sure that it's, you know, highly personalized and really creating a journey that if you were the customer or the prospect, that you would want to go on um, if you were looking at this product or service. And so there's probably lots more we could dig in, dig into as far as like technical ways of workflows and this and that, but, you know, just want to make that point about personalizing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is so basic what I'm showing you right now. This is like uh, a 101, right? But the point is that I really wanted just to show you that the, how easily you can actually uh, create that personalization process for your for your users that won't take you like hours or or weeks to develop or have even hire someone that's really kind of very straightforward here. So for example, once we have an owner, I say, hey, wait for four minutes before you send an email, and then I say send an email on the my BDR behalf. So in a way, whenever I have a new lead, for example, a client of mine wanted to register at seven eight p.m. Eastern time with off hours, right? And my BDR is already having some drink on Friday, right? But if we don't get back to that lead right now, then they would go for a competitor, right? And which I don't want. But I cannot say my BDR to stay late nights to answer emails from the new leads that comes in through or even follow up with them when they registered, right? So what we did, we, we say that, hey, in four minutes when they registered, send a personalized email depending on the live on form submission on my BDR behalf, greeting the client, making sure that they know that we know that they registered, appreciating their time, their interest, maybe asking some questions, maybe sending a link to a meeting invite. And in this manner, um, the client would 
feel like, hey, there's a person that actually responded to me at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. because you can create a very personalized email as an image that it's not an automatic spam email was sent, but actually an email from a person that was sent, right? And this is like amazing because in this manner, we are getting back to our clients faster than our betters are doing. In this manner, our conversion is much higher. Um, so that, and then we wait for two days, for example, uh, to say like uh, if they respond or not. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and then what is interesting here, after, for example, two days, I can say, did they, once they registered and I invited them to our platform, did they spend my trial leads? I say, hey, because I have a custom metric, which is number of credits spent. So how many leads they purchase within leads force. So, and this metric is sent to HubSpot through API that my engineers also did because uh, you guys have, you know, you have an amazing API. But the point is that if I say that this number is greater than 50, then I can trigger one branch. And if it's less than 50, I can trigger a different branch. So depending on the user behavior and the metric, I can set it up differently. And then I can track, I can track whether they clicked on it or not. And if they, if they not, then I can then this workflow, if they click, I can do this. So in a way, then I can create even more and more personalization for, for oh, sorry about that, for, for each client. So what is interesting is that once the workflow is finished, I can set up a goal. For example, like, what do I want to achieve with this? Do I want a registration? Do I want a response? Do I want an engagement, a booked call? And then depending on the result, they can exit the, the, the process, the workflow, or I can finish it by, for example, setting up a task for, for my BDR saying, hey, follow up with the prospect manually, right? Because they didn't go through that. Or I can enroll them in a different in a different workflow, in a different nurturing sequence, depending on their user behaviors, right? And using this algorithm, this process, what we are doing right now, so our numbers are, and we have a multiple uh, companies uh, and multiple projects, but specifically for the agency, we are probably getting around 1500 leads month over month we are getting about 400 new deals created, 400 new opportunities with a closing rate of 30%. And these numbers are being processed only by two BDRs, two BDRs, and obviously sales execs that are taking calls. But 1,500 leads are being processed by two BDRs, two BDRs. Can you imagine this? Like really, um, like it's not 100, it's not 200, it's 1,500 leads with a with a with about like 40% conversion into appointment booked with a high closing rate and with a very high response rate for uh, all the uh, clients are categorized all of them are tagged all of them are nurtured all of them are taken care of all of them are, are are working and passing through subscriber to opportunity right and we were not able to achieve this with you know without actually having the clear streamlined process and the uh, a very powerful technology partner like Housework Platform to that enable us to do that. So, Russ, questions to you. Um, working with with other clients or working with 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 companies and with partners, um, can you share some um, sort of like maybe best practices or some uh, thing that you saw in the past about like utilizing HubSpot for their inbound appointment setting and maybe just kind of handpicking certain, may, maybe missing the names, but really like how they utilize the process in a similar fashion that I, or there was that, that what we did, or there was a, a bit different process, but also efficient with the following numbers. Yeah. I mean, I think you're definitely, I think what you've shown is, is really the core um, foundation that a lot of, a lot of my partners use for their own website and for lead nurturing. I think um, there's definitely something to be said for tailored content. Um, if you are someone that's needing to educate your customers during the sales process, or if that's a normal part of the way you close deals, I think having the right inbound content to match the different life cycle stages or the different um, ways that they've interacted with your website or your marketing activity is crucial. And what's great about HubSpot is you can measure everything, right? We can measure um, the attribution source, the, the place where they first, you know, found us, or we can see if they, you know, clicked on that link that you emailed them. And did they view that PDF? How long did they spend on that PDF, right? 
And all I, I would just say some of that custom reporting, some of that tailored content is what varies from one partner to the next. But you know, most of them have embraced, you know, this this strategy that you're showing because um, like you said, it it really limits the amount of time they have to spend on the you know manual email sends or the phone calls to someone that they're not sure is even interested because they're running a business they're doing a million other things too um so i think uh, i hope that i hope that helps but to me the the biggest thing that is is an opportunity is you know there's a lot of noise right there's a lot of people reaching out to you know so and so on linkedin or emailing them for new products so how do you stand out with some content that's actually matching where they are in your buyer's journey. Michael, I think you're on mute still. I think I was just talking to myself here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for thanks Ross for for answering this. I mean, I I so agree with you, and I think that personalization and 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 personalization at scale is very important, right? Because really having only one process at scale when you talk to hundreds of individuals wouldn't wouldn't allow you to have a very high conversion and satisfaction rate among your clients because in that manner like i i, I hate i hate whenever i sign up for something i'm getting too much calls these days really because people treat me as the buyer if i left the information somewhere and i'm not a buyer right right so and I think that that answered the question of why do you need to do to have different life cycles? Why do you need to treat them differently? Why do you need to have the right automation that will be signed to right individuals in the right time, right? Yeah, and it's it's just a shift in how we sell, right? It 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 should be going from, hey, Michael, I heard you want to buy this. You ready to talk? Are you ready to sign? To, hey, how can I help? Or hey, I I thought this, um, you know, PDF or this white paper would be, you know, useful for you, given that you were on this page on our site, check it out here. You know, yeah. um, it, it's a, it's just a putting the customer first instead of yeah. the, you know, the sale first, right? the, deal, the sale. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to next touch based on the HubSpot scoring attribution that you've mentioned Ross here. So HubSpot, and I can kind of tell you, tell you right now what is this basically. Essentially, because HubSpot is integrated everywhere, it, they track your your website, they can track your forms, they can track the emails. So essentially, it's like a huge tracking friend, right? They what they can do, they can track the behavior of the users engaging with your content. Like Ross mentioned, uh, you can send an email, then you can track uh, email open, reply to click link clicked pdf open how much time you're spending where do you spend whether you go to the website what are you clicking what are you reading through uh are you opting out are you booking something are you attending the webinar are you, do you have a deal do you don't have a deal have you been sent a contract so you can imagine there are a lot of things that they can track and what is interesting is that um and this is why i decided to um to sign up for HubSpot in the first place, because I had this idea of being able to create a process depending on the user behavior and then nurture that user about uh, based on what that person was doing on the website or doing with my content. And HubSpot has the great feature for this. So typically, basically when you go to HubSpot, you click on manual lead scoring, you're gonna see this page. And on this page, right, they're gonna tell you to build uh, positive signals and negative signals. So the positive signal essentially is something that a person is doing positively. For example, I can say, hey, HubSpot, give one score to a person who visits my website once, or give five scores for the person that go to my solution pages and visit my solution page, or 10 scores for a person that opens my email. So I can essentially grant scores automatically for the person or the contact, depending on their positive engagement with my brand. Opposite to this, I can do the negative one. So I can say, remove five scores if you don't answer my emails for five times, or remove this if you never visited my website, or remove this if you didn't click on the link. So I can also remove some points. And what it gives me is that by adding and removing the points, I can essentially assign different lifecycle stage with different HubSpot score. So I know that my subscribers should have this behavior 
my marketing qualified leads to have this behavior and my sales qualified leads to have this behavior. And in this manner, I can treat them differently. And I can see not necessarily, so my entry point won't be a form submission, but my entry point for the certain workflow will be a lead automatically changing the life cycle. So going from that marketing qualified to least qualified or from least qualified to opportunity, right? So essentially here's an example of how this might work for you. So I have a lead and this is just a lead that never been engaged with, with Belkins. They have a zero HubSpot score, right? Like zero. Then a lead goes and downloads a Belkin, Belkins how-to guide. They just go to the website and download the guide. Once they downloaded the guide and they gave me the information, then they became a lead in my lifecycle um, structure. And they, they were assigned 21 points because for me, all the leads should have 21 points automatically on HubSpot. That's it. So now I have a lead with 21 points, right? Because I have a lead and I have a, a lead nurturing sequence, I send two emails, one email and then in two days another. Because I can track the, the lead open these emails, I can assign five scores per email. So now instead of 21, this lead has 31 score already, right? After that, I have sent an invite for the webinar and maybe you guys are one of the leads from my webinar and you sign up for the webinar and you came in here today, right? So I am adding 10 more scores to your account. So now you are 41 score and you are a marketing qualified lead. So in a way you downloaded the how-to guide, right? You open two of my emails and then you are on webinars. So it means that you are marketing qualified. So then once you become a marketing qualified lead, automatically HubSpot gonna trigger an email from my BDR saying that, hey, you've been engaging with us quite a few times already. How was the webinar with Michael? Why don't you book a personalized consultation with Michael to talk about the point in the setting? If you book a call, then you will get 20 more points. And then now you're an SQL with a 61 point here, right? So basically you, you evolutionize from the being a lead with zero points to being an SQL with 61 points. And there was a zero interaction with me or with any one person in, in this process. So zero. So everything was done automatically based on your behavior, based on your user. This is just a very simple example of how this might work, but it can give you an idea of how you can treat differently the behavior and why the attribution is important because you can automatically assign the positive and negative attributes and Hustle will calculate that automatically. And then depending on the trigger, then you can treat everything differently here. Yep. And this is where the reporting in HubSpot can not only, you know, help you set this up, but then improve over time. So maybe we figure out, oh, for some reason, we're, we're seeing a lot of folks drop off or not sign up for the webinar. You know, we're seeing a lot of people stuck at 31. How do we fix that? Or do we need to add a different step? Or, you know, what should we adjust the workflow? These types of questions. So um, yeah, really straightforward, good stuff. Um, this is a, a nurturing sequence. I'm not going to be spending too much time on it. Really, just to want to show you that um, if uh, there is a lead stage, for example, um, you can create a sequence of multiple emails with the delays, with multiple stages that that can then then you can track and then assign a positive scores to a certain. And then when the lead goes through this nurturing sequence, and then at the end they get a score of 61, 62. At any point of time, you can trigger an email, you can trigger a task from an SDR for the SDR, you can trigger anything whatsoever and be able to engage with that lead on certain personalized sessions. So when I think about the nurturing, um, uh, sorry, when I think about this nurturing and what I love about HubSpot is that in this workflow, you can have multiple interchanging instances. For example, when something happens, I can send a marketing email to a person. When something happens, I can send a Slack message to my guys informing them about, hey, John, open and spend one hour talking, uh, spending one hour on our presentation. Why don't you give a call to John right now? Because they are in thinking about working with us, right? I can change the contact property. For example, if you're not engaging, then you are not a marketing qualified lead. Then you are a lead. It means that from instead of the BDR, the owner of that contact will be my marketing manager and then my marketing team that are gonna be doing the nurturing. So I can automatically change the owner. So in this manner, you don't have any BDR with the hundreds or thousands of contacts in your CRM with different instances. And then BDR doesn't know what are those leads and how to work with them. It can have a clean assign or owner based uh, so that you don't have 
thousands of leads just you know laying around in your CRM, but really every lead matters. Every lead in the CRM system has certain goals, certain target that you wanted to hit with them or a certain nurturing process, right? For example, you can also um, send a meeting link depending on, on, on the sort of like, hey, when this happens, send a meeting link. You can show advertising them on a stage or a life cycle. And by the way, this is something that we just discovered just a few months ago, Ross. And we actually, I didn't know about this personally. I, it appears that HubSpot can show different advertising depending on the on a deal stage in the pipeline. So I can show different advertising for people that were on a demo uh, with those that are highly qualified or with those that I sent contract to. So, so in this manner, I can not just show one advertising to all the people in the pipeline, but really I can structure my pipeline and show different messaging for different people depending on their buying journey, which is like. I would say, yeah, the HubSpot ads tool, it's, it's kind of sneaky, it's underrated maybe, um, but it connects to your, you know, your different ad accounts and you can add people to the right audience to your point. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's awesome that you guys uh, started using that. Yeah, and uh, this is something that my, my marketing team very excited about because then they can create other smart ways of engaging and personalizing the messaging, right? Uh, three other things that I love, assigning tasks. For example, like if you don't reply to my emails for a long time, it's going to assign a task to someone to follow up with you via call. Or for example, that remove you from a sequence or do something else with you or create a personalized uh, like uh, manual email. You can enroll one lead to another in a different workflow automatically as well. So in a way, like if it's not happening, then you go to another workflow when something else is going to happen. It's, uh, and it helps to structure the process. And then if then, the, the best part, right? So if this happens, do this. If that happens, do that. And then you can have multiple kind of branching out multiple scenarios of working with, with individuals, maximizing your personalization level, right? Can I, could I throw in a number nine? to this yeah yeah like of course if, if we rearrange this and turned it into a three by three uh custom coded actions right um which is available with our operations hub if anyone's more technical on the call being able to insert lines of code say javascript or html something like that into a workflow in order to make updates to your crm or do you know something else um it's, it's a very new concept for HubSpot, but there's actually a ton of, you know, partners and customers using that already. So um, again, especially for folks that are more like um, on the technical side of, of marketing, um, custom coded actions is something we're really excited about here too. So how would you, how you utilize that? Essentially, so when you have a very complex process of utilizing CRM, you need some custom events, mm -hmm. custom changeables, right? So you sort of like add the code in the process so that triggers whenever something happens, right? Is that That's right. And it, it's exactly, and it's its own action in the workflow. So it, it's called custom code action. Um, I'll throw a link in the chat of some of the use cases for it, if anyone's interested. Perfect. Okay. All right. As I promised 20 more minutes and we can answer some questions in here. And uh, so if you have any questions, guys, please put them in the chat. And uh, then we can go through through those questions together. And then uh, Ross can answer something. Maybe I can answer something. Okay, we still have some time in here. So uh, this, some of you guys asked questions about whether this webinar will be recorded. Of course, uh, the, the recording will be available to you in the next few weeks. So you can listen to this and then um, and then later on follow up with, with, with me, Ross, and others to, uh, you know, to with, with any additional questions that you have. Um, okay, so I see someone. Okay, Justin. Justin uh, raised the hands. Okay, Justin. Let me. Hey, Justin. Um, I just enabled you. If you have any questions, go ahead with your question. But you're on mute. Uh, hey, thanks for that. That was an accident. I, my question was going to be the same as the other people's. If this recording would be available. Um, but I also noticed this. You shared this. Uh, of programmable automation use cases. So basically what that link is, is showing us all the ways that we can automate certain instances in HubSpot. Is, is that what I assume? It's um, what I would say is it's um, it's a part of the workflows tool that, that Michael showed earlier. And it often has to do with um, data quality or making big updates in your CRM. Um, 
a good example is like phone numbers. Sometimes when people enter phone numbers in into a form, right? Some people put the brackets or the parentheses around it. Some people put the plus country code. So what if you, you know, need to have that all, you know, cleaned up, you could use a workflow to automate that instead of having to, you know, update one by one or something like that. Okay. And, and there's a million different uses for it. I uh, would say, you know, it's, it's like many, many different things are possible with it, depending on what type of code or actions you're trying to actually achieve. But um, it's, it's uh, part of our operations hub, which gets added into the marketing hub. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, so one two things that I wanted to mention here, um, whenever you're just starting out with HubSpot, right? And you feel like, uh, you know, you don't have a thousand dollars or $2,000 that you can spend on, on, on a fancy CRM, let's say, right? Because, you know, very, very many people that I've talked to, they say, hey, it's very expensive. I don't know, I don't have budget for this, right? So those that you don't know, you have a HubSpot free CRM with the basic features that you need to be operational. You really start with contacts, you start with companies, you start with deals tracking, with tasks, and you start with the website tracking, and that's it. And I think that for the first month of work, it's going to be a lot for you guys because then everything will still be clean. You're still going to have the life cycles. You're still going to have the statuses. Everything will be in there. I think that, uh, uh, correct me Ross if I'm wrong, but I think that there are some additional features like forms, like two or three forms are available as well in the free package. Uh, not just these features. There are some others, small ones, right? Uh, I think like- Yeah, yeah, that's right. Forms um, and I mean, email, like, Right. Sim simple, simple email automation, not the more advanced stuff that you showed, but, you know, simple email follow ups to forms. Yeah. Right. So you have that. And then as you go, what I'm doing personally, I love the marketing and sales hub. So the marketing hub is about automating my marketing. So automating those forms, workflows. Um, making sure that I can trigger the hotspot positive or negative attribution. So I'm starting really kind of going back to clients with that uh, four minutes email and so on and so forth. So marketing is very important for me for that part. However, I also use the sales hub that enables my sales team, right? Because I also love the the way you can utilize the, the, the Chrome extension because, you know, like, you know that one of the things that happens uh, in every sales team is that you cannot just make the sales rep fills out the, uh, the you know, they log in all the data or make sure that they are keep their CRM clean. You cannot just, it's like, if, you know, if you, it's like uh, getting a treatment from cancer, right? Like, like every sales leader has the problem with their sales team not being able to, you know, update your CRM. No one, right? And you always go ahead and every meeting you say, hey, did you update your CRM? Did you update your deal status? Did you update statuses, right? Uh, yeah happens happens in my team too every everyone yep right yep. and um and what i like about the sales um the sales hub uh, chrome extension is that my guys are using a lot the the gmail work uh workspace and when they're on gmail they can have a hubspot layout on top of your gmail so they can work on their tasks you can work on their deals they can add documents, they can add tasks, meeting links, they can track, they can use templates, they can use sequences, and you can do that all from your Gmail. So in a way, they can update their CRM without actually going to HubSpot and doing that on HubSpot if you have, if you hate the CRM, you know, like because there are some people that say, oh, I don't like the CRM, right? And this is, um, this is very cool because in that manner, uh, either you're using and updating everything on CRM or you're doing that from your Gmail, for example, um, you can do both of those at the same time that enables to have data cleaner in, inside the CRM. So I love that. One thing there, and you kind of mentioned it earlier when you're thinking about folks that manage their sales in a spreadsheet or in email and that's it. You know, the HubSpot email integration makes it all, all of your one-on-one -on -one emails show up in the CRM just because those two are connected. So there, there's a lot of visibility without you having to do anything other than just send emails um, showing up in the CRM. So that's always helpful, especially for leaders or sales managers that wanna quickly see what's going on with a given deal. 
Yeah, yeah. And I use a lot like a forecasting part. So because I have a team of 10 sales execs and we have clear KPIs for a monthly KPI, quarterly and annual goals, right? Um, what I do, I set up that forecasting in the side HubSpot so that uh, when it's done, I can go ahead and I can see how my sales teams are progressing quarter or monthly and how they're aligned and how they're compared. And I can see the pipeline. I can see the committed revenue. And this really creates a different, like a certain part of gamification so that people really go ahead and check out where they are, what is the status, how their pipeline, every, actually hitting that 100% is important for the sales team. And actually, and especially even for the sales leaders that see their whole team completing their KPI and meeting their goals is, is amazing. And I love that part on HubSpot as well. And we are doing a lot of forecasting and uh, that helps me to coordinate the team and manage the team more, uh, more powerfully there. Looks like, uh, looks like we just got a question, Michael. Uh, yeah. What what KPIs have you set up for your sales team, maybe specifically for BDRs versus AEs? Mm. Thanks, uh, thanks, Soren. Thanks, Soren. So, uh, you know, I think that obviously that depends on the business and the business model and the the, the team structure. But really, I think that um, for the BDRs, uh, uh, many people that I that I know, they just set up the 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 number of appointments booked per se, or at least generated, right? I think that that's not the, the, the right way of doing this because in that matter, the BDRs are just focusing on hitting the number, but they don't care about the quality of those appointments and how they're converting in, you know, in, in, in the closed deals, right? So what I like to do, I like, it to, I like to set up a KPI in the quantity and the quality, right? Because if the quantity is, because you definitely need the quantity, right? You, you need a prediction. Am I getting 10 appointments per month or 20 or 50? It's a, so it is a, it's number. a numbers game. It's a numbers right. game at some 100%. level, but, but you also need quality to your point. Exactly. And they need to be incentivized, not just by hit that number, you know, but they also need to be incentivized to hit the quality number. So if a sales exec, it's a teamwork. So I wanted to make sure that if the sales exec closes the deal, the BDR is also getting its incentive is, is, you know, getting some candy on, on, on what they've done, right? And really kind of putting a tag on, hey, this is the lead that I brought. And, you know, and I'm the part of the sales team doing this. I'm not just the BDR doing that. For the sales team, it's a new revenue generated. That's it, right? So how many deals you close? What is the average, uh, average deal size? How much time you're spending on closing the deal? And also the conversions, right? Because what happens is that you not just necessarily need to look at how much revenue you generate, but also how many deals you have in your pipeline that you have added on a monthly basis. Because uh, very often, for example, you know you are not closing your revenue not just because you uh, are a bad sales rep, but you just don't have enough appointments in your pipeline. Because as Ross mentioned, it's a numbers game. So if you are at a twenty percent conversion from an appointment to a closed deal, so it means that um, you know, and you're 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 making ten thousand dollars per deal, then you need 10 appointments to make $20,000, right? So if your KPI is making $40,000, then you need 20 appointments to close those four deals, right? So in the in a given month, if you have only 10 appointments, then setting up a KPI for your sales team of $40,000 will be not achievable. So in a way, if these are not unachievable numbers, then your sales rep will be demotivated right because they like it's unrealistic number i cannot hit it so i'm not motivated to hitting it so you know the the number should be as you know slightly higher than the possible ones right so that you always have that really kind of 100 percent, and then you're hitting 90 95 percent, 98 percent, right but that 100 percent is like almost there right and then for aes it's um uh, for us personally it's the retention revenue, it's an upsell, cross-sell, and, um, you know, and generally, like, how you can, you know, make additional revenue, additional uh, contract value from existing clients and, and adding other products, cross-selling them, upselling them, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and just to the point of how you get to your number as a sales rep, maybe tracking the number of demos or uh, proposals that you send, depends on what you sell. Um, the number of discovery calls or initial meetings, right? It, you know, you have to make sure those numbers match up with the revenue goals. Um, so people know what they need to do to, to get to their number. 
Yeah. 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 And uh, when I mentioned the forecasting, you have a team number that you can set up for everyone. And then you can see their contribution to an actual team goal that they are doing on a monthly basis, which is also great. Okay. So everything that we've been talking about right now, this is something that my team and I, we've been doing for the past three years using HubSpot, building this internal BDR team, building internal sales team, AES team, and so on and so forth. And um, what we realized that probably about half a year ago is that the, the inbound appointment setting process, uh, you know, actually going through and, and qualifying leads and categorizing them and booking calls and making sure that you have very high conversion from an inbound lead to appointment is very similar and to the, the point of the efficiency that we're doing with the outbound appointment setting, where we're doing the same, just essentially we are reaching out proactively to people. So that's why uh, probably about um, a half a year ago, we introduced uh, inbound appointment setting solution, which is in a way opposite to the outbound appointment setting solution, but in the same way mirroring the one another. So with the outbound appointment setting, we are researching leads, reaching out to people, qualifying them, booking appointments. With the inbound appointment setting, we're building HubSpot-based infrastructure on the client's behalf, uh, setting up pipelines, setting up life cycle, setting up positive negative attribution, setting up forms, setting up campaigns, nurturing, and then assigning an SDR who will be controlling and managing all of this in, in, and, and talking and qualifying prospects and then booking calls to, for your SEs so that your sales team can focus on, on just closing deals. So, um, and we've been partnering up uh, with HubSpot uh, since the, the last year um, and, and, and helping out and uh, for example, for those companies and folks that wanted the appointment setting and wanted the HubSpot process that I just uh, showed you with Ross uh, during this webinar, they can sign up for uh, .io slash inbound appointment setting. Uh, they can book a call. Uh, we can get a consultation, get a scope of work. And then my team can set up this process for you. And um, you can work with me and my team and Ross into implementing HubSpot and um, and then um, obviously, because we've done that many times, we've done that for some of our clients over the last six months, and we've done that successfully for many companies that, that, that I am a part of, investor of, or just a part of my group, uh, we can set up the same process or a process that can be tailored for you guys. So uh, if you, any of you interested to have a need, uh, go ahead and, uh, and sign up for, for, for this at uh, belki.io slash inbound appointment setting. Uh, to close up, Ross, any things to 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 mention to 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 gang here? Um, maybe tips or things that they didn't know about Hotspot that they really can get a value from. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really exciting time for us as we continue to build out um, use cases and features in our CRM to you know really complete that customer journey. So I think. Um, there's some fun things, you know, that are coming down or that have recently showed up in the service hub, um, for those that have customer service organizations or that have a high volume of inquiries, FAQs, those types of things. Um, but no, I, I also just saw, you know, maybe a couple other like quick little questions here in the chat. We can just touch on really quick. One was about the KPIs again, just how often do you change? those or how often do you make updates to your team's KPIs? Um, so I'm, I personally, I do that every three, six months, really, yeah. you know, the KPIs are just about, obviously I, I believe that they should be flexible, right? If they, if they are not happening, you can say, well, we already set them up. So let's wait for another six months. No, if something is off, you didn't set up your KPI correctly go ahead and change it, right? right? Because KPI should be motivator, not a, a sort of like a disabler of sort of like, you know, not being able to empower the team, right? So that's why if you need to change something, go ahead and change it on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. I don't know. The, the two I things think, about, go ahead. I, I, say, I think that's important. Like you don't have to wait sometimes if you can tell really early on, hey, this goal that we set is way too hard or hey, it's way too easy. Like, you're allowed to make those changes. Obviously you want to think about how you position that to the sales team, but um, I think that's a great point. Like yeah. check on it every, every three to six months, but feel empowered to, to change it faster. Um, yeah. And then looks like Lori was asking about proposals. Um, I can talk about this one. 
there's a lot of different options for, for this piece of the sales process. It depends on what your needs are as far as what your contract looks like, what the signature slash payment process is. HubSpot actually has a native, you know, pay, uh, uh, I'm sorry, quoting tool, e-signature tool. Um, we use that ourselves. So we, we use, use our own. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, there's also great options that integrate with HubSpot. I think the long time sort of one that's really well known is called DocuSign. And then there's also newer Pandadoc, um, Pandadoc uh, yeah. Proposify are two other yeah. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we use Pandadoc for documents specifically for contracts, but we use native uh, quotes uh, on HubSpot where you can create a template. You can create a line of products. So you can set up like different products, like subscriptions or solution or different packages that you sell. And then your team can just go ahead, create a quote, create a proposal, add the packages, add the terms, add the notes, add a client from the pipeline directly, send it, sign it, pay it, and then just go ahead and just, you know, and, and, and deliver the service. And you can do that automatically, all of that above, right? Um, going yeah. back quickly to, to the, you know, the KPIs, two more things that I really wanted to mention that I learned later on. Yeah. So first, whenever you, you wanted to change the KPI, never change it after the fact. So in a way, like, uh, for example, uh, when you make a commitment with someone with your sales rep that, about certain KPI and someone didn't meet the goal, right? They say, hey, you know, if you meet the KPI or if you didn't do this, that's going to be this or you're not going to get, you're going to have this much money or this is the bonus or, hey, you're going to be fine, right? And then later on, when you need to change something, when you change the KPI, then the, the new process or the new conditions will be, available only after you change it, not before that. So in a way you cannot go after the fact and say, hey, yeah, but we decided that it's a bad process. So all yeah. of the things that, for example, you know, you don't want to pay for the bonus that they get because the KPI was too low, but they hit the 200% of the KPI. You still need to get paid that, work on that commitment. Yeah. And only after you change it to a higher KPI, only then the new process and Conditions kicks in. It's very important, right? Because then you should be fair with what you already done and, and say, right? About the commitment. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll have some unhappy sales reps. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Right. And also, uh, the, the AES and BDR should be, uh, you know, motivated and wanted to, for everything to be fair. And they wanted to, uh, also to, to know that they are listened to and that they can change the KPI, that they are in control of their KPI. So that the KPI is not something that hanging. Uh, around their neck, but this is to empower them. This is to give them the ability to be better, to make more money, to be more successful, and also explain how this is going to empower the company and actually explaining the whole sort of like, you know, logistics of it. Like, hey, this is yes. what we're not doing. If we're not doing this appointments, then we're not closing this clients. Then we're not generating this revenue then we are not hiring all these great people or we're not moving to a new office or we are not growing building or new features or, or building yeah. new features. Yeah. So they yeah. know that everything is connected. They are part of the bigger picture and actually understanding the picture so that they know that everything starts with those appointments that they make. And this is very important, right? Yeah. And, and to also, when you're making those updates to goals or talking about those, you know, having those conversations, just encouraging people, um, because this is a very hard job, you know, generating sales or closing deals. And um, it's mission critical for, you know, companies to continue to grow. 100%. 100% else. Okay, guys, we are out of time. I appreciate you all who stayed and, uh, and to listen to us. Um, as I mentioned, the recording will be available um, you have uh, our contact information. We have Belkin's website. You have HubSpot website. Reach out if you have any questions. Be interested. Be motivated to set up this process. And um, I look forward to having you on our next webinars where we'll be talking about some other um, interesting things that uh, we are doing that Ross and his team are doing. Okay. Ross, I appreciate you taking the time and joining us and sharing your experience. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Appreciate it, Michael. All right, guys. Thank you all. Take care.